Based on the size of this trunk, this giant tree likely began its life more than two and a half centuries ago. That means that it was alive during the Revolutionary War. It's even possible that George Washington walked past this tree, since the house that served as the headquarters of the French General Rochambeau is less than a half a mile from this spot. But honestly, I can't tell you much about the early life of this tree, but I can tell you the exact date that it died. It was the night of October 29th, 2012. I know that date because it also had a profound effect on my life. Maybe not as profound as for this tree, which died on that night, but profound nonetheless. On that fateful night, Hurricane Sandy blew down this ancient giant. In fact, it devastated this entire region. And it wasn't just the wind that caused the destruction. There was catastrophic flooding, billions of dollars of damage, even death. And then there was the aftermath, which for many was even more disturbing. The electricity was out for two or even three weeks, depending on where you live. And in the modern era, this was more than just an inconvenience. The lack of this basic utility created a post-apocalyptic scene. Society screeched to a halt in an instant. Store shelves quickly emptied. Gas stations soon ran dry. If a gas station did get a delivery, lines of cars, often more than a mile long, formed within minutes. In time, people ran out of gas for even their generators. Then batteries, even candles, sold out of the stores within a day or two. Now imagine the Northeast in November, with no work to go to, but at home, no electricity, no heat, no TV, no cell phone, no Netflix, or even flashlight power. Imagine walking around your dark house in November, seeing your breath, with nothing to do but sit around and think about how miserable you are. Or to sit around and hear other people tell you how miserable they are. That was the experience for most people. But me? I loved it. Sure fist fights were breaking out at one end of town at the local gas station. But on the other end, at the local mom and pop liquor store, people were jovial and merry. The owners looked like miners with their glowing headlamps, while the customers enthusiastically traded their cash for full bottles. So, equipped with some good whiskey, I lit a couple candles, buried myself under blankets, and started reading all the old literature that I adored. Believe it or not, this photo was actually taken on Halloween night of that year. You may not be able to see me, but I'm laying on the floor reading. In this photo, you could see my book, and if my memory serves me correctly, it was the complete tales and poems of Edgar Allan Poe. Specifically, I was reading The Fall of the House of Usher. So, cold dark house, cold dark town, a creeping sense of apocalypse, candles, whiskey, Poe. It was the best Halloween ever. In time, I realized that I had a rash in my candles, burning one instead of three like you saw in the Halloween photo. But the whiskey never ran out, and neither did the literature. I read quite a few of Washington Irving's tales, and I put a huge dent in my thick, the complete Sherlock Holmes volume. When the lights finally came back on, my first reaction was to squint at the blazing brightness. And then there was this. Out of the whole state of New York, I was probably the only person disappointed by the return of the electricity. But in the aftermath, I could see why the experience had such a profound effect on me. For weeks without electrical power, I lived primarily off the power of the story. And when that ended, the glaring lights and the blaring noise seemed obscene compared to a world of flickering candles, quiet, simplicity, peace, and literature. I felt a renewed sense of purpose to show my readers a life that has long been forgotten, a life that I try to resurrect within the pages of my own story through the Valley of Darkness.